Well, we got the whole gang here with us today. We got a special guest going to be joining us momentarily. Um, I think it's going to be a fun, fun conversation. Yeah, it should be. Looking forward yeah. to it. Mr. Mike Boyle, the play-by-play -play of the Spokane Chiefs, is going to be joining us here and uh, just kind of pick his brain on the team and you know go through go over his his career and um, you know his what he thinks of the boys basically and try to get some fun stories out of them. So I think yeah. it's going to be a, a fun time. We'll see what we can get him to share. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Huh? I'm Ooh, sure it'll yeah. be an open book. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably. Yeah. yeah. Send it, send him the send him the link. So we're just waiting on him to to click on it and join us. We can talk about the winning streak a little bit if you want. Oh, you wait. We should. I think we should. Yeah. Um. What do you? What's your opinion on how everything has been looking lately? I mean, we talked about it a couple days ago, but. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously it's not perfect, but they've won nine straight games, so. Can't really and, complain about that. And now we're ninth in the CHL, ninth ranked mm -hmm. team in the CHL, which I think is pretty cool. It's the first time we've been ranked since. Actually, we haven't even been in the top ten, and I mean, it's probably been. Were we in top ten during the nine COVID years. year? So the very last CHL poll that came out before COVID shut down, we were an honorable mention. That, okay. That okay. was that was it. So the first time we've been like in the actual top ten, and God knows how long. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, really good stuff from these guys right now. And another game against Seattle coming up, uh, Friday and then Prince George here at home on Saturday, last home game of the first half of the season. Yep. And the Christmas be, break. And are you going to be able to go to that game? Which one? Saturday. I don't see why not. I mean, obviously <laughs> I've got a baby, so you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Things, things happen. So you're done with but... school now though. Yeah. Yeah, actually, my very last assignment of engineering school just got turned in like 30 minutes ago. Oh, so hell yeah, dude. I'm done, dude. It, Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, for a little bit of context to people who don't know who I am, um, I joined the Navy out of high school. And then when I got out, I started doing engineering school. And I've been doing that since 2020. Uh, and I just finished it like 30 minutes ago. So... <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Um, awesome. It's been a long, arduous road, and it's made me miss out on a lot of things, uh, including games. Uh, we had full season tickets, and then when it picked up, we had to drop to the weekend package because just going to Tuesday and Wednesday games just didn't make any sense anymore. So, yeah. uh, But now that I'm done with that, and uh, we're not moving anymore, so uh, yeah, should be good to... Um, get back into that but i wanted yeah. to ask you about that too because i know you just got tickets up until like you know january or whatever what are you gonna do there mm -hmm. have you decided what you're gonna do with that um i still got a call the ticket office and talk to them about that um they i don't know i mean the the last payment for my package was due in november and i paid that for what i had prorated out yeah um but then we decided not to move any longer I don't know. It might be too little too late at this point to extend out to the end of the season. And if it is, then so be it. I have a bunch of never wasted tickets because of when my family got sick two weeks ago. Uh, we missed oh, like, yeah. we missed like three or four games, like right there. Like so that, yeah. Yeah. And I had tickets up until I think early February, which is most of the regular season. So right. Right. And it shouldn't yeah. be that big of a deal. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the tickets are cheap enough. If you really had to you just buy a ticket to go whenever you guys want to go to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not like it's crazy. Yeah, and then we'll get that figured out from there. But I'm gonna call them tomorrow and see if uh, if there's anything I can do about that. But I'm sure they'll probably so, be able to hook you up with something like a yeah, you know, a flex pack or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. especially um, if yeah. podcast comes out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I start plastering our names all over our shirts and stuff. And, there you mm -hmm. go. All right, well, we're, th we're thrilled to welcome our next guest. He's the former play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Tri-City Dust Devils, a part-time <laughs> sports anchor for Creme 2 News, the current voice of the Spokane Indians, as well as the voice of the Spokane Chiefs since 2002. Please welcome Mr. Mike Boyle. Greetings, fellas. Boyle, thanks for joining us. <laughs> thanks man. for we doing appreciate this. appreciate it. Ple uh, it's a pleasure. Anytime. I appreciate it.
pretty uh pretty fun stuff from watching these boys play right now huh it's a lot more fun than two years ago i can tell you that <laughs> uh, you know it's it's been a lot of fun to watch them grow and develop and it's funny because you could kind of see even last year that hey you know we've got some good young talent coming up and if you <laughs> went to any of the training camps and we're watching the 15 year olds there. It's like, okay, we got some guys come. Uh, I, I kept telling people that, you know, we're going to take our lumps here for a couple of years, but then we're going to be really good. And yeah. we've started to take that turn this season. And we're, we're starting to show the signs that, you know, I go back to how bad we were in 2005, 2006. And mm -hmm. you could see even then, you know, with guys like Mitch Wall and, and Drayson Bowman and Jared Spurgeon, it's like, you know, hey, we got some guys. We're going to be pretty good. And oh, by yeah. 2007, it was like, OK, you know, we're, we're pretty respectable, tough team to play against. And then everything came together in 08. And I, I get that same feeling with this group. I mean, they're they're pretty much the same type of, of chemistry and uh, balance and depth. Mm -hmm. um, which I really like uh, the fact that, you know, we can go four lines deep, we can go three deep pairing and, and the young guys don't miss a beat. Uh, you know, we've had some injuries and the fact that, you know, we've had the young guys step in with increased playing time and, and just pick up to where we haven't lost anything uh, has been a really good sign and uh, really excited for what we're going to do in the second half. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think that, uh, as the season got on, you know, we got off to a really hot start and then kind of hit that, you know, low period and stuff too, but that's going to happen in the course of the season. And now I feel like we're yeah. just really starting to take our game to the next level. Consistency no is key. No doubt. And I, and a lot of it, you know, I've, I've talked about some of the younger guys and, you know, I've talked a lot with the coaches of late about the back end guys, you know, Rhett Sather and, and Caden Allen in particular, you know, you're talking two 16 year olds that have had to come in and step in and play regular minutes and we haven't missed a beat with those two guys. And so, you know, Nathan May's injury has been kind of diminished as a result. And now you look at the depth we're going to build now when Mazer gets back in the lineup, which will probably happen either at the end of this week or coming into the second half. Uh, they're just going to be so much better on the back end. And as you guys know, it all starts between the pipes and goes out. And yeah, Dawson mm -hmm. Cowan's been the best goaltender in the league. You got a defensive core that's playing as well as ours is right now. You're going to get a lot of wins going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think Cowan has been just the <laughs> backbone of this team for the last two years. I mean, I can't even tell you the, you know, count the amount of times he's kept us in games like last season, even. I mean, we probably won at least seven or eight games that we shouldn't have won last year because of him. Well, no count, no question. I mean, this year he's even better. 100%. Um, the the thing I've noticed with Dawson this year is he just is so consistent night in and night out. Whereas last year, there'd be some games where it's like, okay, he's having an off night. I haven't seen that this year with him. He, he has been a guy that you send him out there and you're thinking, okay, they're going to get maybe two goals off of him. Maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's a good feeling as a team knowing that, you got a guy back there that's going to shut them down, even when you make mistakes. And then you can allow yourselves to focus on what you guys need to do, getting the puck out of your zone and getting it up ice. Uh, he's been absolutely terrific. And there's no question in my mind, the reason we're where we're at in the standings is because of him. And yep. I think yeah, anyone would say that, you know, Dawson's been, as you said, the backbone, uh, no doubt in my mind, uh, he's been the most valuable player for our club thus far. And that's saying something with some of the guys and their performances in the early going. Absolutely. And what a great guy for Esler to look up to and follow too. <laughs> no doubt. I yeah. mean, Carter, Carter's a very talented goaltender. Yes. Uh, very athletic, as you've probably seen. His ability to go post to post is as good as you'll see. Uh, but the fact that he watches Dawson and the way he approaches the game yeah. right up here, mm -hmm. uh, a, a great – teacher for him going forward and uh, it's only going to make him better going into the next couple three years yeah because Esler's the guy of the future so uh, you know having a guy like Cowan you know to look up to in his 16 17 year old season is definitely going to be really beneficial for him so I I, I agree completely yep no doubt I I'm, I'm excited uh, I like Cal's when he first came to us from Winnipeg mm -hmm. and I, I thought, you know, he's got a bright future, uh, just the way that he followed the puck and was 
what I like about them. And I, I've talked about goaltenders in the past on our club. I said they sometimes look like they're a fish flopping on the dock um, because they're just all over the place. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. Cass, he's just square and just stays mm -hmm. with guys. And, you know, he gets a rebound. He just swallows it up. And that's what you look for. You know, a guy that's calm in that net that's able to just take the puck and swallow it up and not give up a second opportunity. That's huge. And yeah. I think that's uh, been a big, big part of his game this year. Absolutely. As I agree. Um, so boiler going back to the start of your broadcasting career, how'd you get into broadcasting? Oh boy. Not to date myself or anything, but uh, it was back when Reagan was president. <laughs> um, uh, I, I got out of school at Colorado State University. Uh, I played a little basketball there, um, and then I went abroad and went to school in England. Thought about being a history professor. Uh, then I, I said, no, I want to be a sports play-by-play -play guy. That's what I want to do. And so I, I started – uh, in the production side of things, because I couldn't get an on-air job out of school because the same line kept coming up. Well, you don't have any experience. <laughs> you don't have any experience. Uh, so I took a job at the CBS in Boise doing production work. I was a director and a producer, audio guy, teleprompter operator, just kind of learned the business behind the scenes. And then I got my first play-by-play uh, -play -play job in radio in Lamar, Colorado. And you got to get a map to look it up. <laughs> never heard of it. I've never heard of it. <laughs> Lamar, Colorado. It's down the southeast corner. It's about 30 miles from Kansas, about 70 miles from the Oklahoma Panhandle. Okay. So it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, good tornado country. Saw my first tornadoes there. Uh, but I did play by play for 18 high schools and Lamar Community College. Uh, I did that. And then I went back to Boise and I went to work doing play by play for Boise state on the cable station there. I didn't oh, do wow, it on okay. the main main ABC or NBC station that did the games. They did home games uh, for the football team and home for the basketball team on cable. Oh, so, like local. Yeah. Yes. Like your local cable, like channel five cable here in Spokane. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing that and I started doing high school sports and, uh, like national, uh, or I should say, uh, statewide milk bowls mm -hmm. in Idaho. And that led to getting a sports job at the CBS in Boise. Okay. And that whole thing came about, I was filling in for two summers. The station got sold. The owner, Ben Tucker, with Rhett Law Media in Fresno, saw me in Sun Valley one weekend, thought I was the regular guy. <laughs> And hired me as the weekend sports guy. And from there, I went to Tucson. And then I came to Spokane, worked at KXLY with Rick and Dennis for a couple of years. And then I took the Chiefs job in 2002. Right on. So that, that brings me to my next question. How did you end up getting the Chiefs job? Because I, I mean, oh, like 2002, I was five years old. I, I, I grew up listening to you on the radio, you know, doing the games and stuff too. I don't remember anything before that. So how did you end up with that job? It, it's dumb luck. Uh, Jay Stewart, who is my predecessor, uh, he and his wife were having twins. And so he wasn't going to travel with the team anymore. So they called Dennis Patchen and said, Hey, Pat, you interested in doing the chiefs? And he said, well, the Chiefs had been on KXLY Radio Group up until that year. Oh, okay. And then they switched over to KGA up on the hill, Radio Spokane. So he couldn't do it because of the obligations of working with um, KXLY Radio Group. So he went to me. He said, hey, I've given them your name. You interested in doing it? I said, Absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to do play-by-play -play work. KXLY had always shot me down. I tried to do high school games, try to do, you know, other sports. And they basically said, well, you can't because it's not on our station. I said, well, the chief's opportunity came up and I went through about six interviews <laughs> and, and uh, they finally offered me the job uh, August of 02. And I started the next month. Uh, remember my, my first game at the arena. And then uh, my first road game was up in Kamloops and 
Camloose, I don't know if you know the press box at all, but it's mm -hmm. got like a little shelf that you can put papers on. Well, I didn't have a book at that time. So I just had these loose papers. So I turned to the side after the first or the second period had ended. So they're going second intermission. And I knocked the papers off. Oh, and no. I just saw them floating. Down. <laughs> <laughs> I had zero, zero record of what had happened in the first four minutes. <laughs> and so I'm going into an intermission in my third or fourth game as a Chiefs announcer with zero in hand. <laughs> it was brutal oh, to say the least. <laughs> I can imagine. Welcome sounds... to the league. <laughs> it's kind of your rookie, your rookie moment, huh? It was, big time rookie <laughs> moment. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Do you talk to any of the other play-by-play -play guys when you're up, up at those rinks and stuff? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. It, it was funny because I was talking at the party tonight with uh, some people from the team. And I said, it was really a unique experience when we went up to Kamloops and Kelowna earlier this year. We stayed in Kelowna rather than Kamloops for the first game on Friday. Mm -hmm. So we get into Kelowna Thursday. Well, Saskatoon happened to be playing in Kelowna Friday. And we're staying in the same hotel as the Blades. So Les Lazaric, who's like the mm -hmm. dean of the league now, he's been there 31 years, I think, uh, was in town. And Regan Bartell and I are good buddies, the voice of the Rockets. Mm -hmm. And we all got together that night. And we got to figuring that between the three of us, we had worked in the league close to 75 years. Wow. And That's crazy. Uh you know, Tom Boyning is the other other guy. I mean, if Tom had been there, then, you know, you're talking over 100. Mm -hmm. um, but it was unique that three of us were able to get together. And as I said, you know, we we drank the bar dry and laughed our butts off until it closed. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. It, it's funny you mentioned, you know, those two guys, because I mean, at least from my time, if I had to name like the most like recognizable WHL voices, it's Les Reagan Bartell and you like a hundred percent. I, I, I love listening to Bartell call games too. Like when we're, we're playing Kelowna, I'll switch back and forth on the, on the broadcast. Cause I think that that dude, the way that he, you know, calls a game is just iconic. Well, I, it's funny. Cause when Dan Lambert came to coach the chiefs a few years back, he had been an assistant and a head coach in Kelowna. So he's in the office with Scott Burt. Um, who had played in Swift Current when Regan was the play-by-play -play guy oh, yeah. there. And I broke into a Regan Bartell impersonation. <laughs> oh, no. Regan Bartell, Spokane Chiefs. <laughs> Scar! <laughs> Scar! You know, and I just you know, went, in, went into it with them, and they were just on the floor. And, oh, that's uh, awesome. Regan, Regan and I, I just, you know, he always makes fun of me because I take off my shoes during the game. I hate wearing dress shoes. And so when I get up in the booth, they get the first thing that come off. And so I'm walking around socks all the time. And he's always asking me, you still going in your sock or you still going in your socks boiler. And <laughs> I just, I just go, you know, that's just who I am. And yeah, he's, he's one of the good eggs. No question. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of good times and, and good stories over the year. Um, I know my first year with the team, we played Kelowna in the playoffs and that's how I really got to new Regan yeah. at that time. Yeah, he, he he seems like a really cool guy. I followed him on Twitter for a couple of years and every once in a while, I'll just like respond to a tweet and have a little back and forth. He seems like a very, very nice guy. He's awesome. Really yeah. good egg. Or a beaut, as we like to say. A beauty. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, man. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, this year compared to the last few seasons, what do you think is different other than just like the on ice talent. Like, is there just like a different energy around these guys? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing is that the talent is better. I mean, yeah. there's no question. Uh, the skill level, the talent is better, but at the same time, you've got to learn to win. And I think the chiefs have been really good about bringing in guys from other organizations that know how to win. Um, you know, Shay Van Olm, you know, this is a, the kid that played in the Memorial Cup, both with Edmonton and with Kamloops. 
Mm-hmm. He understands what it takes to get there. Getting Sam Aremba, who had played, you know, in the Mem Cup with Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, he understands what it takes. Smith Redman from Edmonton. He gets it. So you you bring in these older guys that kind of show the way on a daily basis what it takes to get it done. And it's it's infectious, you know. Absolutely. Winning as well as losing are infectious. And when guys pick up the habits on a daily basis in their preparation to become a winning team, it shows. It's the same in a losing culture. Like if you got guys that drag you down all the time and don't produce when they need to, that becomes infectious. So it's it's nice to see the transition go to where the guys that are in that room and leading the way get it and understand, hey, this is what you got to do every single day, guys, mm-hmm. if you want to become a winning team as far as your selfless ability to play the game, your preparation, not just physically, but right up here to be ready to play on a nightly basis. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch and you can definitely see the difference from what you saw two years ago to what you see today. Oh, it's night and day. It's (laughs) night and day. And they just look like they're having more fun out there too, because, you know, obviously they want to win. Winning is fun. And so like you said, infectious, they're going to want to continue winning and having more fun. So that makes a lot of sense. No doubt. I mean, you know, I've always said that the game's a lot more fun when you've got a victory on your plate. I mean, it just it just is. And, you know, I played I played sports, too, and I get it. I mean, I played on teams that were absolutely god awful and I played on teams that were really, really good. And I mean, the difference. I don't remember the teams that sucked. I mean, I just don't. Exactly. The memories of those years are blanks for me. Because mm-hmm. uh, I just wanted to forget about it. But the, the games that mattered and we won and were successful, I can remember them like they were yesterday. Oh, yeah. And I'm the same way as as a Chiefs fan. Like, I can remember the good seasons more so than the bad seasons. I mean, even years past, uh, 2018, 2019, when we made it to the Western Conference Final. I mean, I remember that like it was yesterday. But then, you know, last couple of years, it's just like all a blur. Because, <laughs> I mean... It, it, it was, was brutal. Yeah, it was brutal for a couple of years, man. But, yeah. uh, but you I know that's it. that's the cycle of junior hockey, though, too. And I, I, I think with with COVID shutting that season down in 2020, that yeah. that was kind of the sign that it was going to be another rebuilding time because that was you know Ty Smith's last year and Noah King and uh, you know guys like that. So I, I it's the cycle, and the Chiefs are finally back on the come up. It looks like. Right, right. And and that's the disappointing part is that, you know, COVID denied that group the opportunity to show what they could do. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. the way they played through mid-February to the beginning of March, that, that was the best crazy. team in the league. It was by far. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other teams that were at the top of the league at that time, you had Edmonton from the east, and you had Kamloops, Everett, and Portland, as well as us. And – We beat all those teams in that Mm -hmm. stretch, that 10-game winning streak. We beat all of them. Mm -hmm. And I just remember after we beat Kamloops on the 10th of March and Lukash Parikh's goalie goal sealed Mm -hmm. that, we're getting ready to play Portland that Friday. And I'm thinking this is going to be a major indicator for me Mm -hmm. how we're going to look come playoff time because Portland had the best record in the league. Right. And we'd already beaten them at their place in February. I'm thinking, okay, this could be just a reaffirmation that we're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And then the day before they canceled the weekend. Yeah. And the sad thing is we had two sellouts for Portland yeah. Tri city that Friday, Saturday. And I maybe like the rest of the people out there, but I was thinking, Oh, this is going to be temporary. Yeah. I know we'll be back at it by the end of March. Yeah. I thought so too. March, April. And then I remember my wife going, are the Indians going to be able to play? (laughs) Oh yeah. They're going to play. No problem. It'll be fine. (laughs) Yeah. Lost the entire season. And we didn't, we didn't see any activity until that training camp season. The next month when we played March to May. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was a tough part is because 
you know, Adam Beckman was back. Eli Zumack was back. Uh, Topper would have been back, but Luke went off and played in the USHL because he was going to get more games playing back there. Mm-hmm. Um, but you knew after that we're, we're done and yeah. got to yeah. completely rebuild. And that's exactly what ensued after that. Well, I think, I think Matt Bardsley has done a fantastic job of rebuilding this franchise. I think he has done an unbelievable job in a pretty short period of time too. No question. No question. That's a very good point is that they haven't had a lot of time between yeah. what ended in 21 to what you're seeing now. Yeah. Um, and you know, the drafts have been very, very good. Um, they have to be, if you're going to rebuild in a quick period of time, uh, they've been able to get some big league talent. Uh, Mathis Preston as a first round pick. <laughs> He is unbelievable. He, Star is in the making. Watch. he yeah. he blows my mind every game. Yep. He he's got he's got a high skill set to him that's only going to get better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's the fun part about it. And uh, you know, should be worrisome to the opponents because mm-hmm. he is gonna just get better. Uh, but you know, defensively, you know, we've gotten some good young guys, you know, as I mentioned, Rhett Sather and, and Cade now and earlier, but you know, we've been able to come in and you know, Will McIsaac has been a, you know, or just a rock back there mm-hmm. on the blue line. Sage Weinstein, you know, has been from the time he was 16 and started with this club, uh, been very, very good back there. Owen Shetler, you know, he's is having a great awesome year. year. We talk about him a lot. He's underrated and people don't talk about him an awful lot, but you tell you what, you watch him night in and night out. He makes the right plays 99% yeah. of the time. And it reminds me a little bit of a Jared Spurgeon type. He he is he is a little bigger than Spurgey, uh, but the same type of Just, mindset. Yes, that, that yeah. he gets the puck and doesn't try to do too much. Yeah. But if he needs to skate out, he will. If he just gets out by that first defender and gets the first pass off, bang, they're off yeah. and running. Um, yeah, he's he's been very very good in the early going, and he doesn't get talked in a lot about but uh, he's made plays in his own zone that don't show up in the score sheet where he's broken up rushes yeah and broken up advances that you know he's been a valuable valuable part on that blue line for us yeah i've been very impressed with him he just looks like he's his confidence has grown so much from this year as opposed to last year like he looks a lot less timid out there like he's you know knows that he's capable of being the player that he is right now well that started opening night in prince george you know, he yep. gets the game winner in overtime up in PG, and it's just like he's just taken off from there. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, as a 16 last year, and 16 as a defenseman's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard. You just don't find a lot of guys that come in and, and light it up at that age. I mean, right. you know, the last one I can remember for us was Jared Cowan. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. You know, he was just special. I mean, he was just a, a guy that you looked at and said, you know, he's NHL bound and injuries, unfortunately cut yeah. him in his career, but you know, he stays healthy. He's a guy that's probably still playing today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Good. So uh, yeah, I, I look at uh, the guys that we have on that back end uh, and Nathan Mays, you know, he's been hurt, but you put him with McIsaac and Weinstein. I mean, you, uh, you can't tell me any three more physical defensemen in the league than that trio i said the same thing after the first game of the season you know watching that those two games up in pg all three of them were standing guys up at the blue line left and right and i was like this is exactly what i wanted to see from all three of them the last few seasons so it's great to see all of them taking those steps and i'm sure you know being with in nhl camps and stuff too and being drafted probably Mm -hmm. helped help their confidence with that a lot too a ton a ton because you're watching grown men at the highest level showing you how to do it yeah yeah. you're watching that day in and day out that has an effect on you and it's just like oh this is how you have to play to get here and let's not kid ourselves every one of these guys want to get there oh absolutely so they have the opportunity to see it firsthand it's just going to make them better which is great that you know we're getting guys that are able to get there that are going to world juniors like Berkeley Catton, they're looking at the level at the highest that it is. And it just makes them better players because I can tell you, go ad infinitum as far as names are concerned <clears throat> of guys we've had that have gone and done that. And it just mm-hmm. has made them better players to where some of them that 15 years ago are still playing pro today. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, yeah, how many players can you think of from like, you know, the, you know, mid 2000s to up until now that are in the NHL and just contributing night in and night out still? It's it's crazy. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. And, you know, you know, they not only in the NHL, but playing in, in the American League and the East Coast League, playing in Europe, mm -hmm. um, you know, that are, are just, you know, effective players today that were here 15 years ago or more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think that, you know, what these guys that have been able to go to the NHL camps have been able to experience, uh, it's an invaluable experience. There's no question about it. Absolutely is. Um, let's see here. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you have any fun, interesting bus ride stories? <laughs> I'm sure you got a ton. <laughs> oh my goodness. <clears throat> well, Let's just put it this way. Uh, long road trips like we took to the East in October. I wouldn't want to be the guy <clears throat> aerating or cleaning up that bus afterwards. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's you can imagine living with one or two teenagers. Well, you put 20 of them together. Yeah. It's. Like you'll get on the bus about day five and you're just like, Oh, <laughs> what is that? Open it's, windows. It's just the funkiest smell ever. That is <clears throat> testosterone. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 I just, I, I do remember one time we stopped at a Soyuz and they had a rookie border agent because generally you open up the doors underneath and all the hockey bags are there, but the veteran guys just kind of look in and go, okay, all right, looks good. Well, we had a rookie that decided, okay, we got to take the bags off. Oh, boy. And he's got to look at them. Jeez. And I'll never forget. First bag comes up, zip, opens up that bag. His head goes down and it shoots straight <laughs> back. <laughs> and he just said, shut it up. Put it back on the bus. He didn't want anything more to do with it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, man. And, and we were all just off to the side, just laughing our arses off. I mean, it just, it was classic. It really was. Oh, that is amazing. Um, but yeah, we've had, you know, moments where uh, guys have lost. Michael Grabner forgot his passport one time coming back from Vancouver. And uh, we get to the border. He doesn't have his passport. I mean, it's one thing to be Canadian and forget it. It's another to be Austrian. Right. <laughs> no kidding. And we sat there for four hours. And see, oh, man. got the paperwork done. And uh, yeah, let's just say the guys weren't too happy. With oh, that. man. <laughs> After that one, no doubt. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we had we had a <clears throat> trip up to Edmonton. Uh, the the froster wasn't working on the inside of the front windshield. So Bill Peters and I are up there scraping with credit cards because he didn't have, <laughs> didn't have a scraper. Oh, He's got credit cards <laughs> scraping the windows, trying to get a window for this guy. And he was a good old Southern boy. We're driving in Edmonton and he goes, who's Wayne Gretzky? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> we just said oh what what horror trip are we on so billy peters as a punishment to any player that uh <clears throat> wasn't behaving on, on the trip or was late for a meeting or whatever he would say you're going to get 30 minutes with busty <laughs> he just had to sit with the bus driver at the meal <laughs> oh my god uh, that's funny Oh, oh, I love Billy Pete's. Uh, yeah, we, looking... played, we played cards all the time. When, yeah. when Billy was here, uh, Billy, Hardy Sauter, Tim Speltz, and myself played hearts. And Billy professed himself to be the greatest hearts player in Alberta. <laughs> Pretty good title. I'll tell you to this day that he won thousands of dollars off oh of me and everybody God. else. When nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> uh, but we would play. I remember we got done. Uh, we played a game in Vancouver. We got on the bus the next morning and we started up at 9 a.m. leaving the hotel. And we played hearts until we got to Portland. And then we got to the hotel. We checked in. We hadn't finished the game yet. We sat in the lobby for another two hours. Wow. 
and played hearts wow. until we were done. Um, when we won the Mem Cup in 08, what's the first thing we did when we got on the plane that next morning? Played, played hearts. hearts. Played hearts. And we played hearts until we landed in the States. That's great. You know, and then, that is and great. So I saw Billy last year in Lethbridge. He comes up and he introduces me to his assistant coach. He says, he says, I won so much money off this guy. I have to report a different tax bracket. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> right, Billy. <laughs> oh, that is great. Yeah, I, I I always thought that Bill Peters was not only a great coach, but he seemed like he's a character too. Oh, love Billy Pete's. Yeah, I mean, you know, we just, we had so much fun with that group uh, when the team was playing well, which they <laughs> often did in that 08 season. Um, the boys after a road win would always do a chant in the back of the bus. Dun, 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 two items. Dun, 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 two items. I mean, stopping at the seven 11 or something and grabbing <laughs> two items. And so uh, Billy, Billy was really good about that with, with the guys and, they had competitions on the ice, like getaway practices. If we practice in the morning at the arena and we were getting on the bus to, to head to Seattle or, or Everett or wherever, I mean, the guys would just be going at it like it was a seventh game. And he'd be saying, hey, we got to wrap this shit up. We got to get on the bus. You know? <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, he <laughs> seemed like uh, very much a motivator. No question. Yeah, no question. I mean, I, I I saw that with Billy in 07. Adam Hobson was the captain of the team. And Hobby made a bad play towards the end of the game. And it cost us the game losing goal. And after the game, you know, we're down there getting ready for post game and such. And he sent Adam out. And you know, he wasn't going to answer the question. He says, here's the guy you want to talk to and just set him out there. You talk about teachable moment. It was just yeah. like, you know what? Hey, you're going to wear the responsibility here. You're the captain of the team. You're the one that made this mistake. You answer for it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that he was, you know, people look at that as old school. I think old school works. I mean, because, you know, responsibility is where it all starts. Mm -hmm. And he was very big on you being responsible for what you did out there mm -hmm. on the ice. Yeah. And, you know, that was a teaching moment, learning moment for hobby. And, uh, you know, he did that with a lot of guys and they got the message and learned from it and got better as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I think that Brad Lauer kind of brings a little bit more of that back to these guys too. He just, I mean, I, I, from what I can see from, from where we sit and stuff too, he looks like he's a lot more animated with talking to these guys and trying to like, you know, motivate them to do the right thing and be like, uh, like you said, old school, it, yeah. it, it does work. It does. It yeah. does. I mean, I just, I just think that, uh, you know, that's the era I, I came from is that you wore the responsibility on your chest. I mean, mm -hmm. if you, if you are not doing the right things out there, you're the one to answer for it. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. And yeah, it's, it's good to see. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. I, I think Brad, you know, and Brian Pellerin, who's been around this league for, for quite a while um, as an assistant coach, you know, I've seen Pelly coaching in Portland and tri city since I started in the league. Mm -hmm. um, they get it. And, yeah. you know, they, Jake Toporowski, you know, he was around that as well when he was playing mm -hmm. uh, back with Don Knockbauer and, you know, they get it. And, you know, they, they pass along to these guys, Hey, you know what? We're not going to embarrass you, but at the same time, you're going to be responsible. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that uh, is the best way to, to go about building a winning culture. And they're certainly doing that right now. Yeah. yeah. And every teenager needs that, whether they want to admit it or not. <laughs> no question. Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell, tell mine that all the time yeah he'll, he'll do that a few times too yeah oh yeah definitely 100 percent. oh man uh but yeah no i i i think that that what the, this coaching staff is doing has really paid off in dividends so far and uh i'm really just i'm thrilled that we have you know those old school type coaches back again. I think Toporowski's done a great job too. Um, being a little bit closer to these guys in age, I'm sure yeah. that probably helps kind of, you know, get that message through from the older guys too. 
No doubt. No doubt. Because, you know, you have a tendency as a player, and I was the same way, that you don't necessarily go to the head coach with everything. You know, you talk to the assistants. Yeah. And when you have a guy that, you know, was playing not that long ago and gets what you're going through, it's like, okay, hey, you know, yeah, you just bend your ear a little bit. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm feeling. That's that's nice to have. Um, I did that a lot. I mean, I usually went to the assistant coach. There was one I had in particular. It was a younger guy that, you know, just seemed like, hey, you know, he's easy to talk to. He's going to hear me out. And then I know that what I say to him is going to get through to the head coach. Yeah. And uh, there's no doubt, you know, Topper, you know, I've talked with him. He says he's always wanted to be a coach, you know, and I could tell even when he played that he thought the game. Mm -hmm. That's how I played. I thought the game. I wasn't very good um, as far as athletically was concerned. I mean, I played with my head and I was able to make plays because of this. It wasn't because of my natural ability. So I can relate to guys that you know when they get to a certain level it's like you know what these guys are a lot better than i am i'm gonna you know learn the game learn how to play it through my intellect and then pass that along later on i mean topper has been been excellent with these guys uh, which doesn't surprise me in the least yeah no i mean either and he jumped up the coaching ranks pretty quickly so you know jumping up as fast as he did you definitely know that he's going to be a good guy to kind of come back to Spokane and do his thing in a place where he's comfortable and knows too. I'm sure no that helps, helps a ton. No question. Has family here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been, it's been great to have him back. And uh, I have no doubt that he's probably not going to be a long-term guy here mm-hmm. because it's going to be one of those. that's going to make the next steps here in the next couple of years, but uh, no question. It's great to have him while, while he's here. Definitely. The Boiler, over the years, we've heard you interview so many different players and coaches on the bench post game and pregame and everything, too. Is there anybody in particular that stands out for their uh, interviews? Oh, boy. Uh, I think this year, Shea Van Olm has got to be just well, right up there at the top. Yeah. Just Ol- a- <laughs> he, he, he always comes up to me and says, hey, you ever need me, Boiler? <laughs> <laughs> Sage Weinstein's the same way. Sage, mm-hmm. you're going to need an interview me? <laughs> Just go, you know, we're, we're good for now. We were going to have both of them on. We were going to have both of them on a couple of weeks ago, but they had some like last minute scheduling things. I talked to Omer on Instagram every once in a while. So we're still trying to set all that stuff up, but he's, he's a character. Oh, they'll, they'll both be great. You get them together. You'll, you'll be just fine. Yeah. Guys, yeah. you'll be just fine with them. Okay. <laughs> um, they, uh, you know, I look back in the past, guys that I talked to that I, that I really enjoyed. Um, Justin Falk was always good when I talked to him back in 07, 08. Um, always a good guy to talk with. Um, Mitch Wall was another one that I enjoyed talking to. Um, there were a lot of guys I enjoyed talking to outside of an interview situation. That I still keep in touch with today. Uh, interview wise, they weren't necessarily as comfortable, but right. just talking off of the ice. Um, another one, Chris Bruton. Um, for me, best captain that the the franchise has ever had. Uh, you know, he came in, he was captain one year, and he was the glue with that 08 Memorial Cup team. Yeah. I mean, behind the scenes, uh, the way that he was with the guys, he was the leader. He was the alpha dog in that yeah. locker room. And his leading by example on the ice was unlike any other. And to this day, I say he still set the best screens out in front of a goalie that I've ever seen in the chief uniform. Like his ability to get net front is the reason why Drayson Bowman was such a big goal scorer Mm -hmm. because he just knew where to set up and Bose had such a good shot and he didn't need a lot of room. You give him like that Mm -hmm. and that puck was going in it. And, you know, Bruce would just position himself in that right spot and just turn and that puck would go flying by him and in the net. Mm -hmm. Um, That's an art form. I mean, that's an art form. It it's is. Something you can't really teach. You either have that ability or you don't, because 
You look at a lot of guys now, they get out in that front, but they don't necessarily get right there. They're more over here mm -hmm. or, or over here, you know, maybe here, but they don't get here. And Brutes did that consistently. And you can look back at some of the big games we played that season. He was a big reason why we were able to get goals late in games and force overtime or get game winners. I mean, he was uh, – and and not to mention off the ice, just as nice a kid as you could imagine in a great interview. Yeah. I remember uh, you were talking about Drayson Bowman and all the goals that he was scoring that year with Brutes sitting in front of that. I can think of one in particular in the championship game of the Memorial Cup. Yes. Uh, Bowman – just got the puck right in the right in the slot. Bruton sitting in front of the net, just planted there, and he just turns and rips it in that one spot that was just barely, barely open, and it just nailed it. Bruton sitting right in front. Goalie didn't see a thing. Goalie never saw it. Goalie yep. never saw it. And there's there's so many examples of that that he was able to do that and and win big faceoffs and get a goal. You know that same Memorial Cup championship game against Kitchener. It's Brutes that wins that face-off in the right circle, gets it back to Trevor Glass, mm -hmm. and Glasser scores the goal, make it three to one. Yeah, I mean that's that's all Chris Bruton that mm -hmm. made that play possible. Um, he just a consummate player, uh, and and just as nice a kid. I can remember talking with him many a time off the ice about, hey, you know, where where are you liking to go in life? You know, not even about hockey, just in life, what you want to do. And yeah. uh, just a just a really neat kid. And another one I should bring up is Adam Beckman. Uh, Bex is the same way. Uh, you know, he just had a lot of drive to to be the best that he could be. And many times after meals, we would just sit in that dining room and it would just be he and I. And we would just sit there and talk about, hey, what do you want to do? with your hockey career what do you want to do with your life after hockey i mean just you know candid moments uh, sitting and talking with him still keep in touch with him to this day uh playing in utica now in the new jersey system in the ahl and i'm hoping that uh, the devils give him a shot because i watched him in minnesota and i thought he played well and he yeah, just I never agree. really got a opportunity to play regularly and i just hope that the devils give him that opportunity well, I think you got to, you got, people got to realize too, that, you know, those conversations that you have with those players, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whatever, um, that that's huge just for their development in life too. Cause it's like, they can, you know, talk to a, a, a guy that has years of experience with different players and stuff too, and get this advice from, and that's got to help them just in life they too, I, I as teenagers. Don't... Right. I mean, and I, I realized, you know, they're just kids. I mean, they really are. I mean, I remember when I was 17, 18 years old, I was a kid. You know, I may have thought I was an adult and knew what the hell was going on in life, but, you know, that wasn't the case. Yeah. Um, and just anything I can pass along to them and say, hey, look, you know, this is what you can expect. Here's what's probably going to develop. Here's how you can handle these situations. Yeah. I mean, just any little bit that I can give to them, you know, I'm glad to do it. Yeah. yeah. Did the yeah. same thing. I was an assistant golf coach at Gunsay University for about seven years, doing the same thing with both the men's and women's team. The best times I had were on the airplanes, in the van driving to a tournament, or whatever, just talking about whatever the music they were into at the time or whatever it happened to be. Yes, no question. And I, I love talking, you know, contemporary themes yes. with them because they, they think you're a fossil. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, you know, you don't know anything about what's going on. It's like, hey, you know, let me enlighten you a little bit. Exactly. Okay? Um, you know, I've been there in your shoes. Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's fun to, to talk with guys. And you find that, you know what, the difference between kids now and what we were then yeah exactly exactly Not much at all no nope. yeah <clears throat> yeah all the same concerns all the same worries and all the same joys absolutely absolutely so yeah. i just treat it as such you know it's yeah. just like hey been there done that you know here's here's what i did when i was in that situation yeah you know treat it for what it's worth but i just know this is what didn't work and here's what did and you can just tell with, you know, some of the interviews that you do with the guys that they definitely enjoy that from you and they, they like talking with you and stuff too. It's just, you know, 
even guys that we just recently trade for already calling you a boiler in their first interview <laughs> a week and you know like i i notice that every once in a while and uh i just think that's pretty cool i've always thought that was cool Well, it's funny how, you know, they'll they'll yell at it from the back of the bus. Like Erasmus Ekstrom's famous for doing it now, but he just picks up where Ty Shevel Dayoff did it, where Sage has done it, you know, guys from back in the past, you know, David Rutherford. I mean, it, the list goes on, you know, they would just sit there and yell the name in the back of the bus. Um, there was one year, and it was the Mem Cup year. Uh, Billy Peets, when he would get up, uh, when the bus would stop, when we get to the arena, he would get up and he would go down the aisle and give a pep talk to the guys all the way to the back of the bus and then coming back. Well, there were times that, you know, Billy would walk over to the rink and wouldn't take the bus with the players. So we got to Kamloops one time and they had a pretty good team that year. And I think they had gone like 22 and four at this point on their home ice. And I got up and I did a Billy Pete's <laughs> pep talk down the aisle <laughs> and the guys were roaring so much. They went out and won that game. <laughs> and so the next time we did that and Billy wasn't on the bus, they all just started to boiler boiler. <laughs> So I oh, got up and I amazing. did my Billy Pete's, did the whole thing. Guys are laughing their arses off and off into the locker room we go. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I love doing that stuff with those guys. I mean, you know, it's fun to be around younger guys yes. for me. I mean, right. Right. I mean, admitting that I'm an older guy now, but the reality is what it is. You know, I get mailings from ARP all the time. So uh, <laughs> I think that it, it keeps me young. You know, yeah. and it keeps me back in that mentality of when I was riding that bus as one of them. Yeah. yeah. And is it the same way with, with the Indians too? Like similar kind of stuff? You know, it, it's funny because the Indians are a little older guys. Right. So you're not talking 16 to 20s. You're talking more like 21 to 25, 26. Right. <clears throat> so a lot of them are ma mature guys. that are, you know, be in the workforce tomorrow if they had to be. Uh, but we do have a lot of fun together, but I don't ride the bus with the team during the oh, summer. Really? So I drive myself um, during the summertime. So I get a car and I just drive to all the ballparks and do the six day uh, sets. Right. That. So I don't get an opportunity to ride buses with them. I do see them in the hotel lobbies. There are times I sit down and hang out with them, but it's a lot of it. It's at the ballpark. Right. Know, and, and talk with them in the clubhouse or talk with them on the field or in the dugout. Um, and it's funny because again, a lot of the things that they're going through, I went through that as an athlete as well. So yeah, I can absolutely relate to them in, in that respect. And, you know, baseball was my number one sport as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a very good baseball player and had me into the game by the time I was three. Um, so baseball, I, I kind of grew up with. And so it's kind of like a second instinct for yeah. me. So it's, it's much easier for me to, to talk at the level that those guys in the clubhouse talk at. Mm -hmm. We usually only go to about one or two Indians games a year. I, I, I just recently got back into baseball a few years ago, watching the Mariners, uh and oh, you I'm know sorry. yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell me about it <laughs> tell me about it uh but yeah we go to like one or two indians games a year usually when they have like their chiefs promotional nights or whatever like right around when training camp starts but i work right across the street at fedex um oh, okay from vista i so you know i'd be pulling back into the station during the summer and i hear hear your voice ringing through the through the stadium <laughs> from the parking yeah. lot over there and yes yes <laughs> good stuff good stuff yep they I had a great ball they had a great year this year too oh yeah. unbelievable year i mean <laughs> I, you talk about a team where you just kind of got the feeling after the first week where it was like you know what this club has something. And by the midpoint of the year, I was like, this, this club's going to be the team to beat. I mean, if, it, if they don't get hurt too badly with the promotions and they're able to bring back some guys that are halfway decent, this club's got a more than average shot 
And they, they did exactly that. That was a club that just knew how to win. Yeah. You know, they acquired the ability to win games early in the year and they just kept it the entire season. It's unusual to see a team win the first and second halves and then win the title. It doesn't happen all the time. And this club, they just proved they were the best team all year long. Yeah. Take notes, Mariners. That's it. <laughs> yeah. But uh but that that uh hit, walk off hit by pitch to win the title, that's pretty crazy. Well, let me give you the story on that one. Yeah. You know, Al Karras is at the plate, base is loaded. Um, they just brought a kid out of the bullpen. Uh, he's – what was the count on that? Was it first pitch? I think it was the first pitch, as a matter of fact. First pitch. And so I talked to Kyle afterwards. He says, I was not going to fall behind 0-1 because what happened is that – the ball hit the knob of his bat. It didn't oh, hit him. Shit. But he did such a good job. <laughs> like, I'm behind him, and I'm thinking, oh, he just got hit, because I thought he got hit, like, right in the arm. But it hit the knob of his bat, but he turned it down like he'd just gotten hit, and the umpire said first base. The little things like that. Well, player's kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he grew up around his dad in the Dodgers organization and had major league guys telling him from when he was about that high, what they needed to do. And he, he just, he was a consummate pro day in and day out. And I just thought that was just so ingenious and quick thinking of him. And he said, I just wasn't going to fall behind Owen one with the bases loaded. He said, I'm just, oh, you know, and, and if the umpire had argued that no, it hit the knob, you know, he probably wouldn't have fought it too hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the fact is, is that he he did such a good job of selling that, and he sold me on it that the umpire just went first base, and that was the game. That's crazy. <laughs> That's such an insane way to win a championship. <laughs> well, it's almost like a balk off. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. They call that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, do you have anything to ask, Dad? I have a question for you, and you. Maybe there's an answer to it. Maybe there's not. How close were the Chiefs to getting to Memorial Cup when they put the bid in this year? Uh, you know, I, I think they were under very strong consideration. Um, you know, I, I have no doubt in my mind they had to have been one of the top two or three. Had to have been. Yeah. Um, I My personal feeling on this, I was surprised they didn't get it. I mean, I look at the infrastructure as far as hotels, activities, uh things to do in downtown where the arena is located yeah. um, the, the size of the arena and the amount of tickets they were going to sell and the revenue that was going to generate. Yeah. Um, I was surprised. I really was. Um, you know, I know the arena in Spokane is twice the arena that the one in Kelowna is right in all, in all facets. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe it was just a, a vote of, okay, it was in the United States last year when it was yeah. in Saginaw. Yeah. So they didn't want to give it two years in a row to the U.S. I could see that. And also, they lost out in 2020 with COVID. And Correct. they were set to, to host it that year. Yeah. And, you know, COVID, you know, ended up screwing them out of it. So um, I think that, you know, those things probably played a factor. And, yeah. You know, maybe you know the Chiefs will will definitely get a, a better a better result coming up the next time that they go for it. But yeah, you know, at Kelowna, hey, I can think of a lot worse destinations. Exactly. As far as hosting exactly. a Memorial Cup, I mean, yeah. I was just like, you know, I love going up there. It's one of my favorite cities in the league. So I wasn't too terribly sad when it was awarded to them. It's, well, it's, it's close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Four and a half hours. hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's five hours. I mean, you can you yeah. can get up there. Um, and the fact is, is that in 2020, I was kind of excited that year when we were going as well as we were. And I said, man, Memorial Cup in Kelowna, you imagine how many cheese stands are going to be up there? And yeah, I had planned on it. I had, <laughs> I was already making the plans mentally in my head. I was like, I'm going, dude. Yeah, man, it just, uh, it just wasn't meant to be, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, I, that... uh, also, too, with baseball season leading into hockey season, leading into baseball season, what do you do for fun and time off when you're not doing all this stuff? Cause there's not much of it. No, I don't, I don't have a lot. Um, in fact, I'm leaving a week from tonight uh, to go back uh, to Maryland to see my mom and my brother 
Uh, I have not been back in 10 years. Oh, wow. To see them. Um, and it's a chance for my kids to see their grandmother and an mm-hmm. uncle um, back east. You know, my my oldest went when he was a baby. And again, when he was a, when he was four, my youngest has never been back east. So it's a chance for them to see where dad grew up. And, nice. you know, we'll go down to D.C. and see that for the day. And uh, we're talking about, you know, do we go to a Flyers game? Do we go to a Ravens game? Do we go to University of Maryland Terps game? You know, we're kind of, you know, sorting things out and, and what we want to do. But it'll be nice just to get eight days away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not just doing, you know, the Chiefs or the Indians, but creme television, which I yeah. continue to work at. Um, and believe me, they asked me if I was available during that time. I bet they did. And so uh, <clears throat> it, it'll be nice just to have those eight days away because I can't honestly remember the last time. Now, if I think about it, my honeymoon was the last time that I had oh. eight days away. Wow. That's that was crazy. a few years ago. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, you're a busy guy for sure. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, well, Boiler, this was great, man. Thank, thank you for good. thank yeah. you for doing this. This is awesome. No, you're you're quite welcome, guys. You know, anytime you want to just uh, shoot the bull, I'm available. Yeah, sure. I pr- appreciate it. Yeah, I I was telling him, you know, once we started doing this, I was saying one person I really want to get on is Boiler because I think that he would have some awesome stories to tell. So. There's a didn't, lot more in the cupboard. Didn't disappoint, <laughs> that's for sure. We had we had Dan Holden on it about a month and a half ago, or so I know him from the golf course very well. So he was our first interview. Danny, yeah, Danny was my uh, color guy for for a few broadcasts. A yeah, we asked him about that. Yes, well, he had to sit through th- sit through that season two years ago, so that's probably why he stopped doing games with me. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, it's Danny's a great better, guy. Though. Yeah, he's a great guy. He is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but Boiler, appreciate it. And thank you so much. You're welcome back anytime, man. All right. Well, thank you guys. I yeah, appreciate it. it. We'll have uh, a good trip back home and happy, happy holidays. All right. You too, as well, guys. Yeah.